Hello everyone, welcome back to GGN. This is part two of this news bulletin. You can check out the first one that was all about the economy and austerity. Uh, the second one's going to be, be about basically the wars going on in the Middle East and all that stuff. And uh, then I'll get into some Big Brother news. And then I'll final, in the final video, I'll finish up with eugenics, social engineering and that. So this first article I have up is Russia to send ships and marines to Syria. Moscow prepares to defend its citizens and naval base in Tartus. So it says two Russian naval ships are completing preparations to sail to Syria with a unit of marines on the mission to protect Russian citizens and the nation's base uh, there. So again, when I report this stuff, especially coming from like about any news covering the Russians, you have to be a little wary of it. But it says the Interfax News Agency quoted an unidentified Russian Navy officer as saying that the two amphibious landing vessels uh, will be in Syria. So besides these landing vessels, they're also going to have um, a number of Marines and uh, tanks as well. Then we have Russia sending missile systems to shield Syria. It says here, Russian's chief arms exporter said Friday that his company was shipping advanced defense missile systems to Syria that could be used to shoot down airplanes or sink ships if the United States or other nations tried to intervene to halt the country's spiral of violence. So supposedly this general director of the company said he said uh, that these mechanisms are really a really good means of defense, reliable defense against attacks from air or sea. Quote, this is not a threat, but whoever is planning an attack should think about this. An independent military analyst in Moscow said the Russians' discussion of defense weapons shipments undoubtedly serves as a warning to Western countries contemplating an intervention. Quote, Russia uses these statements as a form of deterrence in Syria, he said. Uh, followed by another quote, they show other countries that they are more likely to suffer losses. Then we have U.S. holds high-level talks with Syrian rebels seeking weapons in Washington. So they already have weapons, but they're going to seek more, I guess. And they've held meetings with senior U.S. government officials in Washington. And uh, they want what? The U.S. says here mounts on the U.S. to authorize a shipment of heavy weapons, including surface-to-air missiles, to combat uh, Assad's administration. This is so cute, isn't it? The rebel emissaries armed with an iPad. Uh, showing detailed plans on Google Earth identifying rebel positions and regime targets have also met with senior members of the National Security Council, which advises uh, President Obama on national security policy. So it says here the Telegraph has learned that advanced contingency plans are already in place to supply heavy weapons to the rebels, including sophisticated anti-tank weapons and the surface-to-air missiles. So this is interesting because I just covered about the CIA um, in there as well, now helping with logistics. Uh, and how Libya has been used as a basically a smuggling base and it says here that uh, senior Middle Eastern diplomatic sources said that Libyans supplied weapons paid for by Saudi Arabia and Qatari government funds and private donations have already been stockpiled in anticipation of the inevitable intervention needed to end the Assad regime so the only thing that's in the way is Russia and um, I said here that they refuse to bow to U.S. and British pressure to do more to arrest Syria, slide into sectarian civil war. So, remember the, the recent connection that I made, which was, as long as the United Nations is in Syria, the violence will escalate. So, now the U.N. is supposedly going to be pulling out, which means that they're pretty close to a regime change. But it could also mean that it's going to hit a whole new level of violence that is being orchestrated by... Um, what the government of Syria is calling terrorists. They're being armed from outside to get a regime change, and that's who these guys are. So it's just kind of ironic that uh, these Western powers that are funding these rebels, like in Libya, are creating a civil war like in Libya. They're torn apart now. They're not united at all, and their country is in shambles. And now there's a haven for smuggling arms into other regime change nations for the West. Uh, but these Western powers are going to blame Russia for not interfering, not interfering or intervening, right? So it's all Russia's fault that they're not going in there and helping this regime change take place. Obama to press Putin of Russia on Syria at G20 amid skepticism. I saw this picture. It was kind of, kind of eerie and creepy. But uh, yeah, this is from Los Cabos, Mexico, uh, a very luxurious place to be uh, hanging out and deciding uh, what the global government will do next. And let's not forget too the picture that I've shown with the. Al Qaeda, supposedly an Al Qaeda member walking with the United Nations. So, suspension of UN observer missions serves for Western next steps in Syria. 
it goes on here and it says that the they did basically suspended the patrols of his 300 member team washington says it's studying the next measures it would undertake to deal with the engineered crisis so you know problem reaction solution and engineered crisis so they're creating the problem and of course they have the solution that will be divvied up by the cfr council for relations the rand corporation and all these uh, different types of think tanks and i just caught this look at what they call it towards a syrian led political transition Let's see, if Russia is trying to not intervene here so that Syria can uh, decide its own fate, then it's not a Syrian-led political transition if these guys, these superpowers, want to come in here and force it on them, right? That it's not Syrian-led. It's global government-led. So catch this, guys. This kind of just... Um, verifies what I was saying. Syria has said that violence has been remarkably stepped up since the arrival of the United Nation observers. So I keep seeing this article about without shunning aside military options, without shunning aside military options. So either it's going to be a, a kind of a, a quick regime change or they're going to get uh, declared no, no fly zones and humanitarian corridors and, and all kinds of crazy stuff. Intelligence experts, NATO has options on Assad and it goes on here and it says that an Israeli, a former Israeli intelligence chief has said EU and NATO countries can do more on Syria than complaining about Russia or imposing sanctions. So it goes on and it says here that Assad's generals, secret police, and uh, diplomatic corps are still loyal and important minorities. And that outside the country, Russia, Iran, Shia, uh, Muslims in Iraq, and Shiites and Christians in Lebanon also want Assad to stay. While the West has been saying for the past year it cannot do to Assad what it did to Libya's Colonel Gaddafi because Russia is refusing to give it a UN mandate. So check this out. It says, but the Israeli contact believes the West does not need UN permission to make Assad loyalists think a tsunami is coming to sweep them away. So kind of like psychological warfare. Potential measures include moving a NATO aircraft carrier to the eastern Mediterranean. Um, they've already kind of started to move stuff like that. They already have U.S. troops in Israel, I believe. It says here, Turkish military exercises on the Syrian border. They've had a big, huge one on, um, in Jordan on the Syrian border. Uh, 14,000 troops or something like that training for Syria. Moving Turkish army divisions to the border. Uh, they also, Turkey has like their own little FEMA camps outside there too, right on the border. Conducting NATO reconnaissance flights in Syrian airspace, i.e. possibly reconnaissance drones, sending messages to Assad's generals via intelligence contacts that the world is serious about regime change. And what they're doing, remember I covered this before, the rebels, or whoever it is, they're actually posting members of this administration, basically the Syrian government, they're posting them, uh, politicians and um, uh, businessmen, they're posting their names and their personal information on Facebook. I mean, everything, their phone number, their address, to, and ordering to kill them. These are the rebels that are calling this, the peaceful activists. And finishing up, he says that Assad, if he, know, if he knows that if he uses chemical weapons today, then the end is tomorrow. So, and he uses what? Uh, the West's own little puppet, Saddam Hussein, remember where Rumsfeld and them shaking hands and arming him with all those biological weapons that they gave him. Right, and it says here Israeli. Uh, it says here Israeli citizens were issued a gas mask during the Gulf War, but nothing happened. Right, right. They didn't do it. Just like in in Libya, they said, "Oh, they're gonna." He's got those frog missiles, the intercontinental uh, frog missiles that Gaddafi had. He was gonna, you know, unleash chemical warfare. Well, he didn't. Now, a lot of times, it's either a, it's like Western countries, like the United States, dropping bombs on Hiroshima or something like that, experimenting on them or arming dictators to carry it out and then blaming the dictators when it's actually being uh, funded and um, all the logistics are being carried out by the West. And finishing up with this article, they say, why not kill Assad? And it goes on there and says that basically that there's rules about it and that um, the Russians ha haven't basically given the go-ahead to carry out an assassination so they can't do it. And it goes on and says too that uh, he also said that Turkey could remove him overnight by closing dams on the Euphrates and Tigris rivers and shutting off Syria's drinking water. But he warned that if the West or Saudi Arabia arms the opposition, which they're already doing and have, they would transform the situation from a regime massacre to a sectarian civil war. So see, they're creating the civil war with no innocent victims for outsiders to help. But it works out for them anyways, right? They always win. These bastards always win because they'll cut off their water supply and then they'll say, oh, look at the poor children. They're starving and dehydrating because we cut off their water supply. It's a humanitarian crisis. Associated Press journalists wounded in Syria. So video journalists covering the Syrian uprising for the Associated Press 
um, was wounded while filming clashes between rebels and the Syrian army. So I remember I mentioned before that one of the techniques that the rebels have been using is leading these journalists in the middle of a crossfire to get shelled by the government so they can blame it on the government. That's what they've been doing. Nice little games, uh, tactics. So Syrian former opposition chief calls for UN peacekeepers. The former chief of the main opposition Syrian council on Saturday urged the United Nations to deploy peacekeepers, that's armed peacekeepers most likely, after UN observers suspended their mission in the country, saying that it's clear that one cannot rely on unarmed observers. This is from June 14th, U.S. military completes planning for action in Syria, saying how they would have troops conduct a variety of operations against Syria or assist neighboring countries. Then we have Egypt's military issues decree giving vast powers to armed forces, but few to the president. So remember last video I covered basically saying that the Muslim Brotherhood was a Western proxy. So it's their own little puppet government. And they got in. Israel deploys tanks along Egyptian frontier. Israel deployed tanks along its frontier with Egypt yesterday after a gunman killed an Israeli construction worker in a cross-border ambush. Then in Saudi Arabia, Saudi Crown Prince... Uh, naive to be buried so that's right and it says here that he's a hardline conservative who's credited with pushing back at al Qaeda. so and then i came across this saudi arabia's king abdullah in intensive care unit so possibly some fishy stuff going on there uh we i mean you know you could have harder you know cause somebody to have a heart attack like bribery or something like that you know this stuff exists man it's a crazy world we're living in now german saudi tank deal two times as big says report i've covered this before but yeah uh, it's, uh, basically, the, a lot of the Germans weren't even for this, but uh, they were going to be selling them, uh, Saudi Arabia, these big uh, leopard battle tanks. Then you can check this out. Israel, a strategic asset for the United States, or the United States being an asset for Israel. So this nice piece of crap is written by Robert Blackwell and Robert Slocumbie. Let's check out who these guys are. Oh, oh Council on Foreign Relations, Robert D. Blackwell, a senior fellow, right? And uh, Walter Slogan, oh, Council on Foreign Relations, Senior Council, okay. Saying, indeed, there is no other Middle East country whose definition of national interest is so closely aligned with that of the United States. So, common national interest. That's right, you even have politicians in the U.S. Congress that have dual citizenship with Israel. That's right, even the mayor of Chicago uh, is what? Uh, he's Israeli citizen as well. I remember it was Chuck Schumer, you know, saying, my heart lies in Israel, as he, he was basically promoting... Uh, Barack Obama saying that, you know, all the Israelis and Jewish community need to get on board and support Obama. It talks about how uh, U.S. Homeland Security and other military agencies are turning to Israel's technology to solve some of their problems. They're talking about spying. That's right. Uh, Israel controls a lot of the information that spies on you in your emails and phone calls. That's them. And this little guy right here, Israel's national missile defense will be an integral part of a larger missile defense architecture spanning Europe, the Eastern Med, and the Persian Gulf. This reminds me of that sheik saying that Israel is going to start expanding outwards here uh, very soon, like an empire, kind of like the U.S. And finishing up here in the last two minutes, the U.S. to expand surveillance operations in Africa by Swiss UAVs. So it says here that most of the surveillance planes are made in Swiss Pilates aircraft. And, uh, but basically, it's going on and saying that they have uh, established this air bases across air Africa. They're talking about Djibouti, whatever, in uh, Ethiopia. They're talking about CIA drone strikes, like in Somalia and Yemen. The Chicago murder rate is worse than the Afghanistan war. So since 2001, more than 5,000 people have been killed by gunfire in Chicago, whereas 2,000 troops have been killed in Afghanistan. But just this year alone, more Chicago residents, 228, have been killed so far in the city uh, than the number of U.S. troops killed in Afghanistan, 144. So they blame this all on gun violence. But the problem is, is that good people aren't able to defend themselves. Murder in Chicago, says Obama Manuel, target guns and not crime. That's right, this is where Obama was from, and it says that throughout his short uh, career that uh, he's made it harder for Chicagoans to protect themselves in what is now the most anti-gun city in America. So this is back in, what, May? Rahm Emanuel, crime strategy, facing high murder rate. Chicago mayor announces a new plan. What is that? Oh, that's to a war on the gang. So now it's actually escalating the murder rate. Then we have here, NORAD intercepts two planes flying over Chicago. There is a temporary flight restriction while the Obama family is in town for the weekend. Remember the no-fly zone that was enforced during the NATO summit, a shoot-to-kill order. And then 
And while uh, celebrating the One World Government Trade Center in New York City, they have the entire city shut down for our Fuhrer to keep him safe because he's so special.